Yeah, okay, let's, let's start. Welcome everyone. Um, we will present to you a ROS2 library and interface for dynamic external flight modes. Um, my name is Beat and I'm a software engineer at Doterian. And here with me is uh, Thomas. He's the GNC team lead also working for Rotarian. Yeah, first, some motivation. Um, you might be familiar with the current existing off-board control interface, but if you're not, um, I will provide a brief overview now. Um, so essentially, it's a MAFLINK interface to control a vehicle by sending one of a predefined uh, message set point type. And it is commonly used via MAFROS or MAFSDK. However, there are some limitations with that. The first one is that only a single application can control the vehicle at any given point in time, which means that if you have multiple applications, they need to coordinate between themselves. Then it requires MAFLINK, uh, which makes it a bit hard to extend, let's say if you want to add a new set point type, or if you want to add, uh, access some other custom data um, that's not available over MAFLINK. Then in general, there's only limited integration with PX4, especially regarding the failsafe state machine and pre-arming checks. And there's only a limited uh, set of set point types that you can uh, use. And finally, you cannot control the name that is displayed um, in the GCS, which is typically fine for initial prototyping, but if you want to build a product, then it's just not enough. So here's the outline of our presentation. First, we will show you the, the idea and the concepts of our solution, then how to use the, the library, finally provide a short demonstration with a video, and in the end provide some outlook of future work. So our goal was to create a library with the following properties. We wanted to make use of the ROS ecosystem because that provides us with a lot of existing high-level functionality um, like trajectory or um, avoidance libraries. We wanted to provide clear and easy to use interfaces with well-defined semantics for controlling the vehicle. This includes for which set point types are supported and how to use them and uh, which effect they have on the vehicle. Um, but also which, um, yeah, which, who is in charge of controlling the drone. We, then we wanted to avoid the muffling layer and directly use the DDS bridge. Uh, for those of you who don't know, this bridge allows to directly convert between UARP um, and ROS2 messages. So if you add a new message to PX4, you can directly use it on the ROS side. Then we wanted to make sure that we have a first-class integration with PX4, um, so meaning that the mode should behave like an internal mode, but runs actually on the companion. And finally, it should be simple to extend, for example, if you want to add a new set point type. So this provides an overview of um, our implementation. Um, here you can see the existing structure on the FMU side, on top the existing modes that run in PX4, and then at the bottom the execution pipeline, which includes all the controllers and uh, outputs. And this is the new part on the ROS side. Um, essentially, you, you can have also a set of modes that interface with PX4. And 
the modes essentially send set points um, to the to PX4. And then there's also so-called mode executors, um, which can switch between modes. I will now dive into the specific aspects of these. So first, what is a mode? A mode is a component that can send set points which control the motion of the vehicle. Then a mode is passive, which means that it cannot activate other modes. And a mode itself can perform a number of tasks. For example, it can fly to a target, then lower a winch, release a payload, and then fly back. And a mode can also replace any of the existing internal PX4 modes. So for example, let's say if you want to write an RTL mode that runs in on the companion with obstacle avoidance, it could replace the existing RTL on the PX4 side. And a mode also registers with PX4, so PX4 is aware of all the existing modes. And then a mode can also um, customize its name that is then displayed in the GCS, which the user can select. So let's go into the integration with the failsafe and arming checks. Each mode has a set of requirement flags, and these are essentially booleans that the mode can set. Uh, so here is a couple of examples. For example, a mode can say that it requires manual control, or it can define that it uh, requires a valid attitude, local or global position, or it can say that it requires a, a home position set. So, and in this diagram, you can see what is happening if a corresponding requirement is not met. So let's say a mode requires uh, manual control, but uh, manual control is, is currently lost. In that case, if the vehicle is not armed, but the mode is selected, then the user cannot arm the vehicle. If, on the other hand, the vehicle is already armed and the mode is not selected, then the user cannot switch into that mode. And finally, if the mode is already selected, the PX4 will trigger the failsafe for manual control loss, which is defined by a parameter. A mode can also defer non-essential failsafes. So, for example, this includes low battery failsafe, and it, a mode can use it if it's doing, for example, a critical operation like lowering a winch, so that it, no failsafe is triggered during that time. And then PX4 continuously monitors the mode for a response. So in case the mode becomes unresponsive or crashes, a PX4 will also trigger a failsafe. As we have seen before, a mode is passive and cannot switch modes. So we need something else in order to do that. And for that, we have mode executors. Essentially, these are just state machines that run through different modes and wait for them uh, to complete. Let's say, for example, a, mo an, an, a mode executor can trigger first the takeoff mode, then switch into custom payload delivery mode, and finally switch into RTL. Uh, so for those of you, of you who are familiar with the navigator module in PX4, this is very similar to that. And an executor can only do that while it is in charge. And for that, it defines an owned mode that serves as an activation point. 
So when the user selects that mode, the owning executor gets activated and can start to select any mode. And it stays in charge until either the user switches modes or um, a failsafe triggers a mode switch. And this definition allows multiple um, executors to coexist and run at the same time. Um, it is worth noticing that mode executors are transparent to the user, so the user selects the modes and not the executors. And also important to note that this definition guarantees that a user can always take over um, control, for, take away control from an executor or mode at any point in time by simply switching the modes via RC or the GCS. Yeah, so now Thomas will take over and um, explain the control interfaces. Thanks, Beat. So, control interfaces. Um, so, just a little recap again. So, mode decides what we control, how we do it, and when we do it. Um, and a key point here is that uh, we're streaming set points. So, I just wanted to italicize that stream because this is different than a command where you say, I don't know, like, uh, I don't know, do package delivery mission. Like, that could be a command that actually starts maybe an executor or something. Um, but our Control interfaces here are things we're streaming to controllers directly from the mode. So something that's actively trying to, uh, yeah, make the, the plane move, and uh, the controller should just blindly follow that lead. Um, so we got mode space, we have control space. Again, what do I want to do in a mode? Let's say I want to go to a point, fly in a circle, and do a flip. Um, let's say PX4 has got a lot of different options for me, different controllers. These could also potentially in the future be in uh, you know, ROS space as well. Um, so we have position control, omnidirectional pose control. Maybe for my go to a point, I just need position control. So there's my interface, green line there. So it's just sending position set points. Um, that doesn't mean that I can't have the whole cascade going on behind, but the mode doesn't have to care about this because we define this control interface, position, and then everything else behind is taken care of. So maybe then, Another good point here is that the set point types that are defined in this library um, also specify what rate they need to be sent at. So position control 30 hertz is probably fine. Um, later on, there'll be some other examples here where maybe 30 hertz isn't enough. Um, so now we go to, let's say, fly in a circle. We could even abstract set point types to, to more, I don't know, uh, high level things like a path set point or a trajectory or a spline. Um, can really be whatever you need if it's something that needs to be streamed. And then we pick the right controller, as long as that controller on the FMU or in a ROS node, wherever it is, has the proper interface, the, the one we define here, so control interface, then things will work. Do a flip, maybe I want rate set points for this, 500 hertz, totally fine, so long as we have the connection to do it, let's say an ethernet line or something. Um, but that's what's nice, the set point type itself defines how fast that thing needs to run, and then you just need to schedule them inside the mode. I'll get a bit into that later, um, once we get a bit more in the weeds. Um, so what are we practically doing right now, though? So that was a bit more high level, uh, conceptual. So I put the little caveats here. So what this implementation does for now is we have ROS2 modes, specifically, that stream set points to FMU controllers. Um, and so again, here, this is kind of like a Linux companion computer. FMU on the right side, of course, this, in the future, we really want these all on the same board, really talking nicely to each other with the DDS bridge. But then again, here's our interface. So DDS bridge, or yeah, DDS bridge, and specifically PX4 messages. So those up on the open source repo, um, hope you've seen the PX4 messages repo. That's basically what we're using to convert to ROS2 messages uh, and also UORP topics. So then what this enables is the mode is speaking the language of the internal uh, PX4 messaging system, the pub subsystem. Um, so there's our two, our red and our blue block again. ROS2 mode, we use an update set point method call. I'll get to that also in the next slide. Uh, and then we send whatever these interfaces we define, whether it's a go to, a position, a velocity, um, over the bridge via PX4 messages. These get into the control modules which control the drone. 
So what's an example of a couple of control interfaces we're going to expose immediately with this library? So first one, if you really just want to do crazy stuff, whatever you want, don't want to worry about controllers, anything that's running on the FMU already, direct actuators. Send whatever you want to the actuator directly, servos, motors, control your crazy VTOL platform, whatever it looks like. Do what you like. Of course, this is at your own risk, so um, no guarantees there, right? Um, another one, this is other end of the extreme, so go to, what is a go to set point? So this is one we thought would be just a nice, easy to use starter uh, set point type to just demonstrate, I want to go to a position, uh, I can change that position randomly as I want in the mode over time, maybe I want to have a heading specified as well, and then I just go there. Another part here is these set point types don't necessarily need to be constrained to um, a specific vehicle state. We can also, let's say, this is a more abstract type, so setting a maximum horizontal speed, vertical speed, heading rate, um, that could be dynamically changed and streamed along with it. Let's say I want to slow down how quickly something's moving along my go-to trajectory. Um, I don't know, if I'm nearby some other stuff or I want to have a little bit more safety, uh, I don't know, whatever you like. <laughs> you can put the constraint there, you can make it do what you want it to do. Um, last one here, um, this is so we call peripheral actuators. Um, it's called peripheral because basically you can, independent of whatever the current set control set point type um, in the mode is using, you can just set another actuator. And so why would you want to do this? So here we see our happy package getting delivered with a winch, but probably we want to be in some position control or velocity control, whatever you like. Um, and then at the same time, in parallel, send an actuator command specifically to that winch, that arm, that gripper, whatever it might be. So now, again, I promise getting a bit in the weeds, so bear with a couple code segments, but the idea here is to show how little code you actually need in this kind of sandbox to, to make a new mode. Um, so first, fork the repos. So we have the PX4 ROS2 interface lib. Um, that's where all this mode logic control interface is, is set. Um, internal messages for PX4, that's PX4 message repo. And then of course you need PX4 autopilot to actually make a drone fly. Um, so now we're in the ROS2 world. So typical ROS2 um, kind of directory. Um, so we have, you can make it however you like. This is just a standard way. You have uh, the logic up in the header on the mode and then maybe the node down in the main CPP, like ROS spin. Um, so what's in our header? So all we need to do to make a mode is derive it from the mode base, and there's more base methods, but I just wanted to highlight the most important ones here. So the really, ah, sorry, the main one you're really gonna wanna care about is this, so update set point. This is the thing where all the mode logic goes, do I wanna go in a circle, do I wanna fly in a line? Put it all in there, and then whenever this guy is called at whatever rate the set point type specifies, we're gonna get everything happening. So. Up here in the constructor, I also want to just note that we do need, you know, a ROS node for this to, to function. <laughs> um, another thing here, my fancy mode. Uh, this name here, that's what's going to show up in the um, in the QGC or whatever ground station you're using. So, more in the constructor again. Yes, okay, I said it already. This is what's going to appear in GCS. So my fancy mode. Um, we also want to declare what set point types we're actually using. So here we're using a go to set point. Um, you can actually define more. So the mode can switch between set point types. Let's say if I wanted to go to now, but rate set point next uh, after 30 seconds or something, I could also define that here. Then we also have a uh, different vehicle telemetry. So these are, um, basically we have a couple of these right now. So local position, global position. We're gonna add more of these as time goes on, but uh, at least these are a bit easier to, to make some shared borners out of. Um, this is what a raw subscription would look like, so it's a bit nastier to have to deal with. Um, so again, we'll make some more nice methods to get your telemetry. Um, but basically, you have access to all PX4 messages at any time. So anything you do need from the autopilot on a PX4 message, you can subscribe to it. So now in our update set point function, um, so let's say this is a super simple mode. We First, in the first 30 seconds of operation, just want to call our go-to set point. We're going to one position, whatever negative 20, 10, negative 10 is, um, and then, uh, yeah, return. So 
Next, after the next 60 seconds, or next 30 seconds, um, let's say we want to optionally command the heading, we can shove it in there. Um, this one is just arbitrarily making the heading do a sign kind of wave, you know, whatever you want to do. And then last one here, so after those two are done, uh, again, a position set point, and you can define whatever acceptance logic you want. So let's say you're not happy with how, um, I don't know, acceptance radii work in the standard Mavlink mission, define your own acceptance radii here. Really easy. So position reach, whatever you want it to be, we can put in our vehicle telemetry there and then compare. Um, then at the end, important, you gotta tell the system that the mode is finished, so that's this completed method. Um, tell it it's a success, hopefully it's a success. Um, so then, what about executors? That's one mode. Um, so now if we wanna make an executor, we just need to add one more class. So we derive from the mode executor base class. Um, same thing, stick it in the header here. And um, what's in here? So first thing to note is that it does need a specific owned mode. It needs it to, to operate. So here, this will be our, our fancy mode that we had before. And um, the onActivate function then is what you're going to call to get it started. And now run state, this is uh, not a base, uh, base, uh, base class method. This is just whatever implementation you want to use to run your state machine. Here we just do something simple. We throw in the state and uh, you'll see here in a second how it iterates through. Um, and then of course the, the result message there which needs to be a success at some point. So let's say we have a simple state machine for our executor, we wanna take off use our fancy mode, return, and then wait for disarm. Um, so we call our onActivate function, or when the onActivate function is called, so let's say someone hits the button on the GCS and now the mode executor started, um, it's gonna run this guy. We hit our run state method, and in here, probably you wanna do some error checking, so we can look if the last mode that was run was a success um, or not. Probably do some more error message handling there. This is just a pseudocode. Um, and then we get into our switch case, and first thing is takeoff. So this is actually the native takeoff mode on the FMU that's on PX4 Upstream right now. So we have these kind of convenient functions here, or methods that will handle calling the, uh, the right mode uh, with the right ID. In a second, you'll see what you need to call to just specify the ID yourself, but let's say we do takeoff. Um, after takeoff, let's say we get the good result that we finished. Now we enter into our fancy mode, and um, here the schedule mode method is what's gonna let us schedule that mode. So our owned mode there with the ID, you could also put other message IDs, so whatever else exists on PX4 already. Um, then, uh, next state, so we wait for disarm, or wait, return, sorry. <laughs> then we wait for disarm. This is RTL one here is, again, uh, base class method the native PX4 RTL, you can replace this or use this method just to use the, the one that exists. Wait for disarm and then we complete. So to show kind of what this looks like in a practical example, we have a demo. I hope, if it loads. <laughs> right, so there's the next 500. Um, so mode executor was triggered, uh, so it triggers the takeoff. You can see down on the bottom right corner, I'm sorry for the lag here actually, um, you already see the name, a Dev Summit demo mode on the ground station. Oof. <laughs> All right, so now we're just sending some simple smooth go to set points. Pretty simple stuff, but what's nice is the executor's taking care of all this for us. That one commanded to, okay, turn the heading around. <laughs> Now we're gonna start, again, a go-to, but this time we're limiting the, the rates, so limiting the, the velocities, limiting the, the heading rate, and um, commanding a kind of arbitrary, let's look around in a circle heading along the way. Halfway there, so whatever logic you'd like to put in the mode, you can. We release the speed limits, because everything's streamed again, so you can dynamically change whatever you need on the set point type. Then, switch to rate set points. Do a flip, <laughs> because that's of course necessary. Um, now we're back to a position controlled set point type, and uh, we're gonna use the peripheral actuators uh, type on top of it to drop a package with a servo. 
And then he should go back to a point and eventually, where's the text? <laughs> RTL. So then this is then the standard PX4 RTL that's running on the FMU. Um, I think there's not much else to see here except the, the drone flying back. Um, but that just gives a good example of, uh, again, so mode, or the, yeah, the mode executor shows up in our list on ground control and we just click it, we manage all these states however we want, it's not set with, you know, Mavlink specific protocol, um, you make your own acceptance radii, you do whatever headings, whatever control set points you want, schedule things in the way you want, it's supposed to make things a bit easier for you. So eventually he gets down. Um, yeah, but then that's, uh, that's it for the demo. Um, so where are we at now? Uh, so still a bit in maintenance. Uh, um, so let's look at a bit of outlook on, on where we're going in the next weeks. Um, first thing, yeah, we're a bit behind schedule. We need to merge the open PRs with the user guide and the PX4 autopilot, but that should happen very quickly. So Hamish, I know you're looking at us. Um, there will be some nice docs for this, uh, more than my really bad pseudocode you just had to bear with. Um, so then another big thing, since we're entering more ROS community space, so we still haven't really settled on, should we use NED like our aerospace roots and FMU world does, or uh, ENU, that's maybe a debate to have another day. Um, vehicle types and mode compatibility, so obviously every set point type won't work for every single vehicle type. Um, so we need to think through how do we make sure we can, I don't know, check this on the autopilot already if uh, a specific set point type is gonna work for your airframe. Um, more set point types, that's obvious. We wanna be able to do more things, um, but we wanna be a bit careful as we proceed to make sure we have stable interfaces that will be useful. Um, PX4 parameter access, so let's say I wanna know what my bare minimum constraints are from the, from the airframe. We wanna be able to have a, a service to get that up onto the ROS node so we can compare against it, use it, whatever we need in the mode logic. Um, and then of course, once we get to the nice part, this is the fun part, high level control, trajectory, patch generation, manipulation, use all the ROS2 libraries, whatever you like. Um, these will be nice things to also have in, in the, the library. So let's say if you don't want to worry about tracking what progression of the point on your trajectory on the polynomial you have and you just want to throw a spline in and let everything else handle it. So that might be something nice to add to the library. Um, and then GCS integration, visualizing these things. Version compatibility is the last one. That's going to be important. Um, but um, basically as PX4 main proceeds on, your messages will change, PX4 messages will change, and we just need to make sure that uh, these APIs still work as we go on and make new releases. And last, um, I'm not sure when this will be on the timeline, but it'd be nice to actually have it in Python as well. Python's a bit easier. Um, but yeah, that's uh, it. So if you have any questions for either Bayat and I, I'd happy to field them. message that there, there's multiple paths forward and I think in the longer run we need to see what works best but uh, one approach is as you said you can build everything together but then essentially you're coupled together right so you need to you cannot just update px4 but you need to rebuild uh, all your modes on the ROS side as well if you do that approach so I think we'll need to have some more flexibility in the long run there um, and there's actually, in maybe if you're familiar with ROS, um, there's work in ROS ongoing um, where they want to support um, message 
um, message translations for on message uh, changing messages over time and creating um, some compatibility functions uh, where you can essentially write um, a conversion between messages. And, and this is, I see, one approach that we could take. Yeah. Maybe on the last point there about uh, get moving things off of kind of the FMU for, for bare bones stuff, like yes, we should definitely just focus the microcontroller on real time stuff and hopefully this will be a nice starting point, this library to help us, let's get high level logic off, uh, use Linux compute power and um, yeah, keep all the stuff that needs to be real time, yes, still in the microcontroller, but just have a nice clean interface and, and keep it going. <laughs> he was first, all right. <laughs> Uh, kind of along the, lane, along the same lines, uh, I noticed that you had a uh, custom mode being shown in Q ground control. Did you recompile Q ground control to have knowledge of that mode? No, that's, that's one of the new things we also introduce now. There's a new Mufflink API for querying modes. Uh, and we extended that to make that um, actually dynamic. So you can at runtime ex um, say, okay, hey, my list of modes changed, and the GCS will dynamically re request those modes. So that's fully dynamic now, yes. And that's um, in QGC daily now, is that in? Yeah. Okay, so uh, does the case for, uh, so does QGC query the case for now for the modes, or uh, is the modes still headed based off of the um, so the current mode is looked at by the yeah by the heartbeat as you mentioned yes, um, but there's a separate protocol essentially where the, um, GCS can query the list of available modes, and this will include all the PX4 modes, but also the ROS modes because they register with PX4, so PX4 knows about the full set and will just send it to the GCS. Yeah. So I'm getting the, the cut sign, but we can definitely chat outside. I think we went a bit long, sorry about that. Um, but thanks everyone, happy to chat outside. Thanks.